1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I'm going to read a few verses, beginning in chapter number 17, or not chapter number, verse number 17, chapter number 1. The Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. We pe preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now, for those of you that study your Bible, you will know that the church of Corinth had many a problem. They started out on the right path. How do you know that? Because earlier on in this chapter, the Apostle Paul says, what y'all doing? We didn't preach to you while we were there. He says, I know what we delivered unto you. And then, by implication, you know, they start talking about earlier in this, that, you know, some of them were of Apollos, and some of them of Cephas, and I of Christ, meaning the one that they received the gospel from. And the Apostle Paul saying, I know what those guys preached, and they didn't preach this to you. He says, there's no hierarchy in the church that, well, if you got saved under this preacher, it means you got a better dose of salvation than the other one. Hogwash. Right? He said, whosoever may come. Right? That means he'll give everything regardless of who showed up to receive it. Right? In the parable of the rich man ahead of the feast, he said, go into the highways and the hedges. Right? That was the lowest of the low, the outcast of society. Had no place with everybody else, but yet he said, go fill my table. You know what they've received? The same food. But they also had a bunch of other stuff going on. We don't have time to get into everything going on at the church of Corinth this morning. But first thing, the Apostle Paul, we had to mention that, because he said, outside of the house of Stephanus, right, I believe he mentions them in verse number 16, yep. He says, besides Christanus, and then two verses before that, and, or Stephanus, verse 14, he says, Crispus and Gaius. He says, outside of them, I don't know that I baptized any of y'all. He says, well, then we don't even have time to get into, well, why do you care about who baptized you? It's all about who saved you before you got baptized, but anyway. Whole point being, he's trying to say, all a bunch of foolishness. Okay, something that you have decided is important in your spirituality, not that important. Not worth a plug nickel. Right? And then we can, if you really wanted to, we could go and look at how all of us are just vessels that God uses, instruments, tools. Right? His hand's the one that does the work. So why do we care what instrument he uses to do it? As long as God's will be done, hallelujah. It doesn't matter if this morning the pastor gets up and preaches or if you know, one of the youngins around here gets a hold of God, right? yields themselves, they testify, break down in tears. doesn't matter if we can understand what they're saying. God may fall on this place. It right? doesn't matter who it is. All we seek is that the Lord show up. Right? Well, by extension, the apostle, who cares what instrument God used to put you back together? He just puts you back together. Right, that's the important part, that you're that new creature. That you go out and you live the new life that Christ gave you. He said, but instead there's bickering in the church on who's got a better position in the church based off of who they were saved under the preaching of. And that don't make any sense. So, he says, verse number 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize. He said, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. He said, God didn't call me to go around just baptizing people. You know who he did call to do that? John the Baptist. But you know what John the Baptist did besides that? He did a whole lot of preaching. Right? In fact, he was prophesied that there'd be a voice crying in the wilderness. 
Right? What do you think that was? As preaching. And I believe he was a pretty good preacher because according to Jesus, outside of John the Baptist, no greater man born a woman. Right? I believe that he could, you know, rear back and let it fly. But the Apostle Paul wasn't John the Baptist. He said, God's mission was not for me to baptize. Now we'll find where he planted churches. We'll find where he went to, you know, cast out demons out of those that have been possessed. You'll find that, you know, he went and preached to the high, preached to the lowly. That when, you know, it seemed like the world was trying to oppress him and he needed food, God provided a way for him to mend nets, right, or to sew tents together, that he'd work with his own hands and labor. All oh, why? Because God called him to go somewhere else or God had called him to that place and God provided a way for him to make ends meet. He said, I did what God told me to do. He said, it wasn't to stay around and baptize people. He said, baptism, I mean, we, our pastor preached on it not too long ago. right? It's an ordinance of the local church. It's not up to one man to baptize. It's out of the authority of a called out body of believers. Right? It wasn't the apostles' job to baptize. It was the church's job to baptize. Right? But we go on. He says, he sent me to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. But now, some of us in this room, okay, I'm trying to think. I've got to do some math. Okay, it's been 21 years for me. Don't know how long it's been since you got saved. But can you remember, before you got saved, what your mind did when you heard about Jesus heard about the cross what your flesh did when trying to rationalize believing on a man that died on a cross and that all your sins would be forgiven right it seemed like foolishness to you how do you say that because it doesn't make sense to the flesh flesh is carnal flesh is sinful right the word of God is not by the flesh discerned no it's spiritually discerned and how do we receive that discernment? From the Holy Ghost. So before the Holy Ghost dealt with you about being a sinner, if you heard about the cross, it was foolishness to you. It didn't make sense. Right? It'd be like me going out there and telling you that if you filled your gas tank with tomato juice, you'd get better gas mileage. But right? you'd like most of you probably give me a double take. Sister Janet probably believed me. But outside of that. Right, the rest of you is like, that's a bunch of nonsense. Right, that doesn't make sense. I could sit there and try and rationalize with you all day long about how tomatoes can burn in your, you know, in your combustion engine. Guess what? It doesn't change the fact that it's not going to work. Right, I can try and explain to you something that you don't understand, but unless you have a desire to understand, it's foolishness. Now notice the Apostle Paul didn't say that. You know, we, the cross of Christ was foolish. It seemed foolish to the world. Right? But later on, he says, but it was the power of God and the wisdom of God. Right? If the world came up with a plan for someone to have their sins forgiven and be adopted into the family of God, born into the family of God, one of these days married into the family of God, spend all of eternity with the triune, thrice holy God, Right? It wouldn't be that a man would be born of a virgin, live 33 and a half years of sinless perfection, and then die on a cross to shed his blood for you and I. And then, he was not killed by the Romans. No, he gave up the ghost. Why? Because he had power over life and death. Then three days later, he took up his own life again. That doesn't make much sense to the world's wisdom right now after, we're biased I've got the Holy Ghost living inside of me that bears witness to the fact that one that happened and that two I received him as my savior okay it's hard for us to go back and understand and think like we used to right, to remember what it was to 
hear the gospel in the flesh say that's a bunch of nonsense but that's what the world hears when Christ is preached to them keep in mind Jesus being the light the Bible says that light dwelt in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not before you were saved you were in darkness you were blind you had no sight if you was in a dark room and somebody shined a flashlight directly into your eyes doesn't matter how dim that flashlight is it's going to hurt it's not going to make sense when you turn that flashlight on all they see is white they don't see colors they don't see the rest of the room it's almost blinding because they're so used to the darkness in fact if you do that to somebody most of the time they're going to yell at you and say why in the world did you do that but we were in dark and we needed to see so I turned the light on that makes sense but when you're accustomed to darkness light doesn't make sense you want a flicker you just want enough to see just in front of you but yet God come and deal with you and say here this is what you need it's like being blinded by that light in the dark you ever do that by the way by accident Right, you go to hit the fan switch and instead you hit the light switch in the middle of the dark and then you're, it hurts your eyes when that happens not only is it jarring is it, it's painful that doesn't make it in hindsight ah oh, that was foolish I was just trying to reach for the fan switch but, but that's what the world thinks when they hear about Christ first time they hear it light may not shine in their direction but if the Holy Ghost starts dealing with them it's going to be a jarring and conviction can be a painful experience and what makes sense to the flesh if it hurts stay away from it but don't be surprised when somebody hears about the gospel and if God decides to deal with them that they try and run away that's the carnal man's natural instinct why do you think that God does the miraculous work of conviction through the Holy Ghost and not you and I he can go places we can't no matter where they run not only is he with them while they're running he's there waiting on them when they get there just when they think they've got away and they can lay their head down somewhere and they think that they're going to get respite the Holy Ghost will start working on their heart again now to somebody that doesn't understand anything about God anything about the Holy Ghost that you, they say that's foolishness until they experience it then in hindsight they say it was alright everything was true what are you saying brother George well he didn't come preaching in wisdom he didn't try to explain things that there was no way for them to understand you know what they could understand that God loved them that God sent his son that his son bled and died for him willingly took up his own life and then offered to pay their ransom which was what? death he took their death, their hell and their grave so that they wouldn't have to now that may still sound like foolishness but that's a whole lot easier to understand than trying to explain to somebody never been saved, never been around church maybe grew up in church but they's always on the outside, the fringes they were never a partaker trying to explain to them what the Holy Ghost does good luck trying to explain to somebody how a virgin that's never known a man can have a child well it was an act of God they say but tell me how he didn't come with man's wisdom but he come with he said he came preaching less the not with words was less the cross of Christ should be made of none effect I've fallen down this rabbit hole a time or two somebody come up and ask me a question one night off the top of my head I remember a guy I worked with one time a real nice guy he was raised Catholic yet somehow he came on to his own conclusion that the Catholic church was a bunch of nonsense then on his own he determined that the KJV was the best version of the Bible that there was don't know how he got to those two on his own but hallelujah but one day he came up at work out of the blue and he said how do we know that the devil was the serpent in the garden okay so we take him 
show them a couple of verses where it says from the beginning he was the deceiver right? that he was the father of lies right? that God wasn't in anything but, but the devil was the father of lies and that if we lie we're a child of the devil right? and we go through all of what did the serpent in the garden do he beguiled and he lied not to mention the fact that in the book of Revelation it calls him the serpent referring to Lucifer what are we saying well, I tell him there you go then it's another question and another question and another question don't have a problem answering them but you know what he never wanted to ask about the cross he was looking for ways and odd about ways to say well if that part of the Bible doesn't make sense I don't have to deal with the cross we talk about everything but Jesus when he started the conversation you know what happens when you start trying to explain the things that God's done how he did them why they happened people keep asking why or more and they want to know how this happened and that happened all I know is what the Bible tells us all that you can ever know is what the Bible tells you but if you're busy explaining the re if the Apostle Paul showed up and said let me tell you why from Genesis until you know, Malachi because the rest of it hadn't been written yet they still living it at that point right even though the gospels hadn't been written he could preach about Jesus why because he met him on the road to Damascus but if he would have started from there to Jesus and said let me tell you about how all this makes sense you know what kind of questions he would have got same ones that people want to ask you well, how did God part the Red Sea? Well, the Bible says he caused a strong wind to blow and it split it in half and dried out the ground on the bottom. Yeah, but wind had never blown like that before. It doesn't matter. God did it. Or you say, well, where did the dinosaurs come from? God made them. We got proof that they existed. But when they die, I don't know. But they died not around anymore closest thing we got is gators and maybe a Komodo dragon that's, that's as close as we got the rest of them dead but people will nitpick on the things that don't matter to avoid the cross but because in their mind if they can prove that one plus one doesn't equal two they don't have to deal with the complicated issue of them being a sinner and Christ being the only way for them to get to heaven Right, well why did God do this because God saw fit to do it it was God's will well was he correct God. his ways are above our ways God's will is infallible right, people want to tackle issues like that right, because they can understand the difference between killing and not killing but then they want to split hairs on what well, the Bible says that thou shalt not kill yes well does that mean that if somebody's attacking your house you shouldn't shoot them well if you want to get real nitpicky Bible says thou shalt not kill referring to murder right unjustified in many cases premeditated but whether it was premeditated or not thou shalt not murder it is not in many times the Bible talks about those that were invaded doesn't say that they killed those that came. What they do? They slew them. Two different words. See, if we get down that rabbit hole, you know what the point they're not going to bring up that they don't want to understand? Well, why did Jesus die for me? How did, he, how did the Apostle Paul show up? He didn't show up saying, setting up a little shop, says, Ask me anything about Jesus. No, he came preaching. Preaching confronts you with the truth that God wants you to deal with. We don't get to come in and take a little poll before Sunday school, right? Or on Wednesday night after church, we don't do a little, you know, straw poll. Well, what do we want Brother Doug to preach on on Sunday? No, he's going to preach. You know what that means? God's going to confront you with something. 
whether it's something that you have done wrong and need to correct whether it's something that you didn't know God wanted you to do but now he's confronting you with the fact that he wants you to do it he could confront you with burdening you for, for somebody in the church may have never been burdened for him before but God wants you to be burdened now may be confronted with the fact on how great he is and how much we fail him in praising him you just want to crawl into the altar and say Lord I know that you're great and mighty and I know that my best efforts don't even come close to what you deserve to be praised but Lord give me another song to sing for you Lord give me the words to stand up and testify for you tell others how important and how great you are to me what you've done in my life that nobody else could do preaching confronts you know what wisdom does wisdom diverts but if, if, that, if you know the answer to this do you know the answer to this and to this and to this I know this that you need Jesus whether you've received him or you haven't received him you know what everybody needs Jesus you know what somebody that's been saved a hundred years still needs Jesus because as long as I'm in this flesh the Bible says that we're more than conquerors through him not through me but he goes for the verse number 18 the preaching of the cross of them that perish foolishness but of the us which are saved it is the power of God after we get saved you know what ought to be your favorite place in the world Calvary even if you've never been there never seen it never seen photos of it and truth be told it don't look today like it did back yonder but you know what Calvary is that's the place that God added you into the family of God I mean I love that song that the ground is level at the cross but you know what the implication of the Bible is that through the Holy Ghost he convicted you and took you to that cross where you could see the darling beloved son of God beaten, bruised, battered beyond recognition shedding his blood and you realizing that was for you you know where you got saved at the foot of Jesus at the cross because that's what the Holy Ghost had to convict you of that that's what you needed you had to see it whether in your mind in your heart through the scriptures you had to come to the understanding of what he went through for you so that you could accept it somebody doesn't understand what happened on the cross they didn't get saved you can know that you're a sinner but until you know what the answer is you can't get saved but after we get saved you know what the cross is that's the power of God you know why I can have the power of God because of the cross you want to know how the church can have power because of the cross you know why the cross is hanging on the baptistry and then outside on that wall and there's one up on the steeple because of the cross this church can have power with God on earth without the cross there's no indwelling of the Holy Ghost without the cross there's no assembled body of believers right? without the cross there's no personal relationship with God there's no corporate relationship with God as a church we're no better than the Jews in the Old Testament who knew what God expected of them but they still didn't have a relationship with God the cross it's not only where the power comes from it the Bible doesn't say that the cross gives power it is the power of God you know what happened on two crossed wooden beams God's power overcame sin, death, hell, grave does not your Bible say that he rose victorious over the grave you know what happened on that cross every single imp and devil in hell as David wrote through prophecy in one of his psalms that the bulls of Bashan compassed me round about as Jesus was hanging on the cross everything in earth and everything under the earth in hell was trying to kill him they didn't succeed you know what the cross is is the victory the power 
that God's stronger than the devil if he didn't know that already. You know what the power of the cross was? That even though we deserve that, the power of God said, I'll take the punishment and impute. That means purposely give and nobody could take away righteousness unto those that believe on my son. All the benefits that you have today is because of the power of God that was shown on the cross. You know what the cross is? It, has, it is the power of God to save another sinner. You know why people can still get saved today? Because of the power of God on the cross. I mean, the songwriter got it right. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Right, bring it scenes before me. Why? Because the greatest demonstration of the power of God from the beginning of time until today and up until the point that the Jesus comes back after he splits on the Mount of, you know, lands on the Mount of Olives, splits it white in half. Greatest demonstration of power that God has ever given was on the cross. After we get saved, you really want to, you know, don't know about you all. You all might be super spiritual, more holy than I. Okay, but those days that you start in the flesh questioning, well, how in the world is this going to get fixed? Right, what in the world is God going to have to do to straighten this out? Right, you know what in the spirit I do? Hey, he handled worst. But how do you know that? Because on the cross, the greatest display of power that God's ever shown. Right, it was so important to God that he blocked the sun out. Caused earthquake. Dead people got up out of the ground to testify the fact that the one that just died was the Son of God. Very powerful. But as a result, we all got into the family of God. Those that still get in, get in through the power of God. But to us that believe, the cross should be one of our most cherished places that we know of. He's still not hanging on the cross, but if I can get back to the cross, the devil can't convince me that I'm not saved because I remember where I got saved at. You say you really get saved over on the hillside in Jerusalem? No. I was in the garage. But you want to know where in my heart the Holy Ghost had taken me? To Calvary. It's the power of God. It reminds me that if He overcame that, He didn't ask me to die on my own cross. He told me to take up my cross, follow after Him. He said, take your burden. I've already handled the worst part of it. I see the power of that. And he said he'd not put on me more than I could bear. He promised that his yoke was easy, that his burden was light, that he is meek and lowly, that he's gentle. What do you say? He took that so I wouldn't have to. And if he promised that my burden would be light, that demonstration of power, I know he can handle whatever else. I don't need to worry about what he's going to handle. I believe that because of what he did on the cross, he's more than powerful enough to take care of anything else that comes my way. All he asks me to do is take up my burdens. And even when those burdens get heavy for me, what did he tell me? Cast all my cares upon him because he cared for me. He said, even when that cross starts getting heavy, you know who will help you? The one that's all powerful. I hate it. When my throat gets like this. <coughs> Not used to drinking water while teaching. Throws them a train of thought off. But, verse number 19, for it is written, here's the Apostle Paul doing a little bit of teaching of his own. He's saying, from the beginning, what's God said? I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that belief. He says, God has always said, what, that he'll use the base things to confound the wise? Right, that he'll topple the wisdom. 
Anybody ever heard this before? Lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he shall direct thy paths. You know what God has always said? Your wisdom will fail you and God will prove your wisdom wrong. He says, I will, verse number 19, destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, a prudent person isn't one that claims to be wise. They just know the best way to do something. I mean, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But if somebody that's done something their entire life tells you this is the best way to do it, I'm going to listen to that person. Why? Because they got a little bit of prudence about them. Right? I know nothing about building a house, but if Brother Ray gave me some instructions on how to build a house, I'm going to follow the instructions. It may not turn out right, but it's not because the instructions weren't right. Why? Because I believe that he knows the best way to build a house. Why is that? Because he probably uses real wood. Right? He probably doesn't skimp on things like, you know, foundation. In fact, I've seen the way he, does, he overbuilds things. He doesn't just assume that that'll be good enough. No, no, no. We're going to go the extra step and make sure it stays good. Why? Because in prudence, he's understood that sometimes things bend, sometimes things warp. Sometimes things get wet, and wet causes weird things to happen to things. Right? And then if it's wet and it doesn't dry out and it keeps getting wet, you know what happens? It comes rotten. You know what can solve that? A little bit of overbuilding. You say, well, it's more expensive. Not in doing the whole thing twice. That's twice as expensive. But it? that's a little bit of prudence. But God says that he'll take the prudence of man, knowing how, the best way to do something, and what's he say? They don't make it nothing. It won't, it won't even be the worst way to do something. It's not like he's going to take it and make it the worst way to do it. He says it's not even going to accomplish anything. He'll make it nothing. Well, certainly, talking about all of eternity, all the wisdom of man, foolishness. The prudence of how this world will tell you to live your life, to make it to heaven, not going to get you to heaven. It's nothing. All right, well, verse number 21. After the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. After God made everything, after God instructed man on what it took for them to please God, which was what? Not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and to do what God instructed them to do, to keep the garden. That's all they had to do. Yet man's wisdom caused them to fall. And all the wisdom since, even though everything that God had done for God's people, all the things that God had shown to the enemies of God and those else in the world, everybody knew about Israel. You don't believe me? Go over Book Kings. Read about when Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon. How'd she hear about Israel? World tra word travels when God does something. People find out when something that doesn't make sense happens and they want to know why. Well, the Queen Sheba found out when she came, she realized it wasn't Solomon, it wasn't Solomon's wisdom, what was it? It's Solomon's God. That's what made Israel special. But since the beginning, he said, here's what it takes in order to find favor with God in every dispensation. And you know what he's done to the wisdom and the prudence of men? not going to get you anywhere with God you got to do it God's way they've tried everything all their wisdom they knew not God our verse tells us they couldn't understand anything about God in their own faculties go look at all the wickedness and the silliness foolishness that's going on people trying to when Elijah prayed down fire from heaven right which really that's a, incorrect Elijah prayed because God told him to and then God sent fire down from heaven. But all the prophets of Baal cutting themselves, carrying on all day long, hooping and hollering, trying to praise Baal. All the prophets of the grove making totem poles out in the middle of the woods thinking that that's what it'd take to find favor with God. Look at some of the crazy stuff people believe around the world today. 
That's what the wisdom of man and the prudence of men will get you. Nowhere. But, verse number 22, for Jews require sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. He said, it doesn't matter what they're looking for, what matters is what they need. We preach or confront them with Christ on the cross. Then he says, verse number 24, but unto them which are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You want true wisdom? It's found in the cross. You want true wisdom afterward? It's found in the one that hung on the cross. You want the power of God? starts with you getting to the cross. Then God demonstrating His power by saving you. You want power after you leave the cross? It takes Christ. Want wisdom and power? It's found in Christ. Truly, you want a sign that God loves you? Get to the cross. He'll take you as you are and turn you into what you ought to be. Make you a new creature. But what's all that take? It takes faith. That's why God upsets man's wisdom. So that man can never get to the point where God, you know, it doesn't make sense to, believe, to trust in God. No, no, no. You either trust Him or you don't get nothing. Not talking about, you know, it was well, as long as you trust him, he's going to give you a mansion on the hillside and 19 cars. One of them an Aston Martin like Jordan wants, right? No. Not talking about, you know, easy believism. Not talking about that not sowing seeds and reaping a hundred times what you gave to God. No, no, no. I'm already reaping far better than I could ever sow. No, I'm saying that what the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please them no faith you don't have the power of God don't have the wisdom of God don't know how we got off on all that but the whole point that we was going to talk about today right? he says he promised to make the wisdom of man foolish turn the prudence into nothing right? I've just shown you on how when you came to God you didn't come with wisdom you didn't come with prudence What'd you come? Asking him to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. But yet I see so many Christians go out into the world and then try to live through the world with their wisdom. Right? They try to do it in their prudence on the way that they think is best. Admirable thing, you know, admirable thing. You want to do the best, you want to do what's right for your family, one go out and make the best future for your kids. That they could, you want them to have it better than you had it. You want to give to them the things that you never had. It's all admirable. In fact, I believe it's biblical. But how are we going to do it without the power of God and without the wisdom of God? You know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. When I got hired on at the job, and they handed me a packet about this big with all the benefits. There's like 18 different options that I could do for health insurance, life insurance, you know, short-term, long-term disability, AFLAC, right? All them things. I sat down, it started making my head spin. I, I tried really hard. You know what I ended up doing? I sat out all the different options and I prayed over it for a while. Right? It wasn't a couple of minutes. It took me a couple of days, but you know what? God eventually said, just do that one. Okay. Let's be honest. Anybody know what the stock market is going to do tomorrow when they ring that bell? No. You know who does? God. I could have spent days or weeks, however many hours, trying to dig into, well, what does this company offer that this company does not? God told me to use that one. That's what we're doing. You know what I got to do in all that time besides stressing and losing a whole bunch of my free time? I got to enjoy doing those things which God called me to do. I got to live instead of being, you know, bunkered down trying to find my own wisdom and my own prudence. Now, am I saying go off half cock? No. But you know what I did have enough sense to know? My faith isn't in my retirement plan, it's in Him. 
by saying empty your 401k and you know put it all in a bank account no because I know what happened in 2008 and then during the Great Depression right just because it's in the bank don't mean that it's going to be in the bank when you go to get it out you know what I do know he's in control now take this with a grain of salt don't have kids but I've seen a lot of people raise kids I've seen a lot of people go crazy go gray and have a whole bunch of bags under their eyes trying to figure out how they need to raise their kids you know who, who can raise your kids Jesus you want your kids to have the power of God and the wisdom of God in their life it's not going to come from whatever routine that you put together for them it's going to come by the power and the wisdom of God in all truth you don't know what my parents did with us they taught us to love Jesus taught us that no matter what they would love us even if they had to correct us and on top of it all that there was a church out there that would love us no matter what happened and you know what as a result happened were we always perfect absolutely not okay Christian who is not here today and revenge is coming to him um, on Wednesday night pointed out several of my failures okay and revenge is a dish best served cold brother Randy one of these days we're going to, I'm going to use the screen again and I'm going to say and for our next point it's going to be an embarrassing picture of Christian every point now, I have no idea how that got in there but were we perfect no but we knew that the love of God was stronger than any of our imperfections we knew that there was a church family that worst comes to worst they'd be there to pray with us to help bear our burdens and that they wouldn't look at as different just because something in the world because in God's eyes we still the same in their eyes we still the same got all these things going on in our life try to figure them out try to rationalize them we go to everybody and their brother trying to say well what'd you do in this situation well how many examples you want me to give where what one person did didn't work for them because God wanted to do something different right? we desire the wisdom of God the power of God where do we get it the cross in Christ you want your tomorrow to work out not ideally right? not the way that you planned it but you want your tomorrow to be in the will of God ask him what y'all do is it always going to be easy no you may end up on a ship, you know, a ship that ends up getting wrecked, where the storm is so bad you didn't see the sun or the moon for a couple of days. You get shipwrecked, and then while you're building a fire, a snake comes out and bites you on the hand. That's all right, not a couple of good days. But you know what the Apostle Paul said? Nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. You know what happened out of all that? A bunch of people got saved. You know what happened out of all that? The Apostle Paul actually got to live long because he didn't go to Rome on the boat he got a little bit of extra time in the world you know what happened during that extra time he wrote some letters to some churches God used him to be a help to a whole lot of people so he said you want the wisdom of God you want the power of God in your life forsake all the junk he's going to turn it to nonsense he's going to take the prudence to turn it to nothing but if you truly want it just look to him and you'll have more than you could ever want Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.